A change by the NCAA is set to pour millions of dollars annually into women's college basketball. The tragedy has put scrutiny on the CrossFit Games. Warner Bros. Discovery is in serious trouble after a rough earnings report. The youngest ever U.S. male track athlete is set for his debut. And we're getting a look into an HBCU-focused media company with its founder, Curtis Simons. It's Friday, August 9th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's show, we'll be looking into a tragedy that happened at yesterday's CrossFit Games with our senior reporter, AJ Perez. We're delving into a major move toward pay equity by the NCAA with our reporter, Amanda Kristovich. Newsletter writer David Rumsey joins to discuss the challenges facing Warner Bros. Discovery. And we'll hear about the growth plans for HBCU Go with its founder and president, Curtis Simons. First, here are the day's top headlines. An athlete in the CrossFit Games drowned during an event that included a 3.5 mile run and an 800 meter swim. The athlete went missing on Thursday morning and was eventually found using drones and dive teams. The company suspended all events following the tragedy. Katie Ledecky and Nick Mead have been chosen to be the United States flag bearers at the Olympics closing ceremony. Ledecky, the U.S.'s most decorated female Olympian ever, secured four medals at this year's Olympics, bringing her total count up to 14. Mead, who helped secure gold in the men's four rowing event for the first time in 64 years, becomes the first ever rower to be a flag bearer for the United States. The global and U.S. anti-doping agencies are at odds due to USADA using athletes who tested positive as undercover agents to expose drug cheats. All athletes who acted as undercover agents were allowed to continue competing but required to keep clean. The World Anti-Doping Agency responded with a statement on Wednesday saying, It is ironic and hypocritical that USADA cries foul when it suspects other anti-doping organizations are not following the rules to the letter while it did not announce doping cases for years and allowed cheats to carry on competing. Warner Bros. Discovery's stock tanked on Wednesday, dropping nearly 10% in after-hours trading to hit a new low of $6.90. The update comes off the heels of Turner Sports losing its rights to NBA games, barring an unexpected legal result of their lawsuit against the league. In its financial statement, WBD attributed the plummeting stock to the difference between market capitalization and book value, continued softness in the U.S. linear advertising market, and uncertainty related to affiliate and sports rights renewals. And Old Miss coach Lane Kiffin is being sued for a Twitter post. In 2016, Kiffin posted a passage from a book called Winning Isn't Normal, written by Dr. Keith Bell. The post was met with multiple cease and desists and eventually deleted. In March of 2022, Kiffin posted a photo of a passage from the book and captioned it, Winning Isn't Normal. The latest lawsuit claims that the post was identical to part of the book and that they were commercial in nature. Bell seeks damages for copyright infringement. Up next, just hours into the start of the CrossFit Games, a competitor in the swimming portion of a distance running and swimming competition drowned as he approached the finish line. Our senior reporter, AJ Perez, joins us to discuss what we know about the tragedy so far. Joining me now is front office sports senior reporter, AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Thanks for having me back on. Great to have you, um, on, though, on unfortunate circumstances, an athlete in the CrossFit Games drowned on Thursday morning. Um, still, information is still coming out at the time of recording, but what do we know so far? Yeah, this morning uh, it was reported that a, uh, uh, at the end of a swim, a run swim event, it's uh, kind of a newer addition to the CrossFit Games uh, over the last uh, few years that uh, he, their uh, swimmer didn't cross the finish line. You know, there was, uh, there were, he, uh, from the videos that appear to show this, uh, this that he was in distress and kind of just kind of just dropped out of view um, in between a couple of paddle boarders who were there for for safety reasons to yeah, as spotters to to kind of you know look for d- swimmers who are uh, in distress and obviously it's a little hotter they, they hotter down there in, in the Dallas area than when they had the games up in Wisconsin um, that you know there there's a lot of different factors that could go into this it's still too early to say why um, but yeah this so after. About an hour after he uh, uh, this um, this competitor kind of uh, vanished um, from this race, they uh, pulled his body out, and um, you know they uh, and and unfortunately, uh, this is a uh, you know one of those rare rare deaths during these, these kind of competitions. And uh, I've covered uh, one of these before in a, a different kind of sport. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, this is a rare event. Injuries obviously are are quite common, but. Um, deaths are not. Do we know anything about the circumstances or at least the context for, um, for how this one occurred? 
Yeah, not yet. This could be anything from exhaustion to uh, severe cramping. We don't know. It's going to take a few weeks uh, to get the final results from and uh, go from there. You know, it could have been a heart issue. It could have been in many things. Um, and it could have been, you know, this in while this looks like it could have been preventable, there's always a chance that that, you know, sometimes you know, athletes, no matter how well trained and how, how good a shape they are, they are. And we've seen this many times over the decades, you know, a sudden a sudden heart issue pops up and uh, and, you know, no one no one can really do much um especially when you're he was so close to the finish line too that's what that's what's the, the hard part it was like you, you could see the dock where the finish line was in 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 these videos and it's uh um you know it's a lot of you know there's gonna be a lot of finger pointing and when i when i covered the 2013 crossfit death here in west virginia um you know there that was something where there were where the friends of this competitor and these anybody can do a tough butter so uh but it's kind of like you do sign a death waiver as they used to call it and um and um the the friends of this guy it was it was uh, it was another a water event they just jump into a like a big thing of muddy water uh and uh and if the friends were signaling to the divers next to him hey my my buddy's in the water and they didn't respond fast enough i think that was part of the settlement in 2016 uh was 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 part of that and it's you know as someone who does who's done these kind of races i've done about 50 obstacle course races and a long a lot of uh, a couple 24 hour ones and some very long ones um, that, uh, you know, you're always cognizant as some, as a competitor to, to, to keep an eye on your fellow, you know, you know, your fellow, uh, tough mutters in that example, or, you know, whatever obstacle Spartan race, whatever you want to keep an eye on each other. And that's really while you're, while your goal is to do, you know, as best as you can do for yourself, uh, it's also about helping others. But when you're in a swimming situation, I've done, mar- I've done, no, sorry, I've done marathons too. Uh, when you're, when you're doing a, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the closest thing for me would be a triathlon, which I've done a few of them on um, shorter ones. You know, it's it's tough. You know, you're especially after a run. I mean, that's uh, it's that's that's could be exhausting. And I think, uh, you know, I just it just it's just really sad to see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, this was a you know, three and a half mile run followed by 800 meter swimming race. But, you know, people race in these sorts of competitions a lot. And, um, you know, fortunately this is a pretty rare event. Um, yeah. And certainly too early to point fingers exactly, but, um, there's CrossFit's going to come under scrutiny. So what sort of, you know, both internal and external looks at the, the company and the way they run these competitions, are you expecting here? Yeah. For Thursday, they canceled all the other, uh, all the other events that were planned. They have, so far, not canceled the rest of the CrossFit Games. Um, I think that you know they're going to make that determination probably next, you know, by uh, by Friday morning. Um, so you know that's tough. They're they're, they're going to reassess how they do it, and it's a lot of these times it's they're with the, these events they 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 hire contractors. They yes yes the fire department's there and the police and everybody else are kind of contracted as also to be there, but they also hire these outside firms, and so that that includes divers and other first responders who are there to to, you know, keep an eye on these things, you know, will they, will they go back and reassess how they hire those firms? You know, that could be, there's going to be a lot of things of like, uh, you know, whether there's going to be, they're going to do some kind of pre competition, uh, test, uh, before they, these competitors are allowed to do some of these events. Cause it's like, you know, the, there's a lot of warnings when you, when, when you do water events too, if you can't swim, don't do it, you know, don't enter. That's kind of, that's what they, that's what they put on us as competitors. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you can't swim, this is not for you. Uh, now there's no indication that this is that he was he, he could be a world class swimmer and a bad thing can happen. It doesn't matter. I mean that's why pe- people make fun at the Olympics why there's lifeguards at the pool there in Paris. It's like they're there for a reason. You know, even the world class swimmer, even in a pool that's not that deep, bad things can happen. And um, so that's when you're when you're in a lake like they were um, in for this incident today on Thursday. Um, you know that's you know it's it's, it's harder to police it's a, it's it's or or to you know to kind of keep an eye on it's it's a, it's a big body of water a uh, larger body of water than a pool and it's a lot of the times there's not the 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 water clarity is not there you don't really know sometimes but um you know if the, if there wasn't some, if they if those spotters miss something going under you know there's everybody else is swimming the the, the, the other competitors may, may not have seen it and not a lot of it was 8 around 8 in the morning local time and probably not a lot of spectators out there yelling things like, hey, there's, you know, there's, so there's a lot of factors that can go into it. We just don't know. And I think the investigation um, done by the you know, Fort Worth authorities and anybody else, including the CrossFit officials, you know, will give us an idea of what went wrong and how to prevent it in the future. Yeah, absolutely. AJ Perez, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me.
The NCAA is set to pour tens of millions of dollars into women's basketball programs every year after proposing a unit system patterned after the same system in men's basketball. Front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich joins us next to give us the details and implications of this long-awaited move. The NCAA is instituting a unit system that will pay conferences for participating and advancing in the women's basketball tournament. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great. Great to have you on. So the NCAA is allocating $15 million for these payments in the 2025-26 fiscal year, $20 million the next year, $25 million year after that, and then the fund increases 2.9% annually. How is this money going to be distributed? Well, that's a good question. I think the distribution um, at this point is going to be similar to the formula for the men. So basically everybody, every conference gets part of this pool for uh, participating in or being eligible to participate in uh, the women's tournament. And if you remember, every conference in division one, um, you know, theoretically gets at least one team in, right? So that's part of it. But then the bigger pot, the quote unquote units pot, is based on how far you advance in um, the tournament. And for the men, there's like an average of like a six year rolling period. Each unit let's, is, is around $2 million. Obviously, it's going to be a lot less for the women. Um, but generally, that's kind of how the distribution is going to be. I haven't seen any specifics. The NCAA hasn't released them beyond just saying that, you know, they're going to model it after the men. This is still in the proposal stage right now. There's going to be a vote in January. Mm -hmm. Any chance this does not go through? Oh, man, I would be so shocked if it didn't go through there. That would be such a PR nightmare for the NCA. I mean, look, the vast majority of the membership, at least from, you know, the women's basketball coaching perspective, they all want this. The players all want this. I imagine the athletic directors who, you know, have women's basketball teams in Division One that may be anywhere near qualifying for the tournament want this because it just means they're going to make more money. Um, you know, it's, it's a highly popular idea. It's been in the works for three years. I would be extremely shocked if it didn't pass in January. Yeah, makes all the sense in the world. Back to the money part of this. Do we have a sense of what the conferences will do once they get, you know, a... $15 million total, and then up from there, what do they do with that money? Yeah, I mean, look, it's up to um, it's up to the conferences what they want to do with that money, um, kind of like the CFP, like the distributions technically are up to the conferences. Um, so if they want to give a school like all of its units, they could, but that's not really usually how it works. Um, you know, and, and, and then I just want to point out, you know, obviously the total pot is 15 million, then 20 million, then 25 million. Whereas for the men, it's um, more than 200 million. And that's because of the disparity in the value of the two media deals. But just like, you know, keep in mind that there's still a huge gap between what the women are making and what the men are making. Obviously, it's better than what the current situation is, which is the men are making more than 200 million and the women are making zero. But, you know, it's just important to note, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you how close this gets us to gender equity, and it sounds like not that close, but, you know, at, at least it's a first step, I guess. Well, I mean, I would say that in general, the idea of having a women's basketball performance and conference fund, the idea of incent financially incentivizing schools to have good women's basketball teams, right, which is essentially what this program does, is the number one, you know, after the new media deal, is the number one way to improve gender equity. That's what multiple coaches, including Don Staley, have said for the past few years. Um, you know, but again, as, as you noted, the true equity comes when, you know, the money, the, the disparity between the two prize pools starts to, you know, lessen. And so we'll see when, if or when that ever happens. But, but again, you know, if you're looking for, I guess, a finger to point, you point the finger at the media deal because the percentage of the women's media deal that or the percentage of this that that this pot is comprised of, it's like about 25 percent um, for these two funds of the women's media deal value. Same for the men. 
right? So you point the finger at who did these negotiations, whether or not you believe the argument about should the women have gotten more, et cetera, et cetera. It's not really about the decision to make the fund. It's about the money from the media deal that they're pulling it from, if that makes sense. Got it. And so this financial arrangement, again, assuming this all passes as written, um, this sounds like it's pretty locked in for this media deal and things can change when there's new media money coming in, but that's not going to happen for a little while. Uh, until 2032, which is when the both, both the men's and the women's deals are up. So there's a possibility that they could start negotiating together in the future, although obviously um, given what happened with the NBA and WNBA versus World Cup, there's a lot of questions about, you know, putting men's and women's, a men's and women's media package together versus keeping them separate versus what the NCAA has to deal with, which is, you know, they have women's basketball plus other championships that are not men's division one basketball. I could go on and on, but you know, the possibilities are endless starting in 2032. You mentioned uh, South Carolina coach Don Staley. She's said, you know, throughout the years, this is the most important step the NCAA could take toward gender equity. Why was it this unit system and, and not something else? Yeah, again, um, you know, the media deal is something that the NCAA didn't have a choice. They had to renegotiate it because they need a media deal. Obviously, um, the, the idea that women's basketball, you know, will get more money through a media deal is very important, but to, I think the coaches, like from their point of view, from a team specific point of view, incentivizing your athletic department to invest in your sport, because if you're good at your sport, you will literally earn more money for your conference slash athletic department to her and to many women's basketball coaches. They see that as the biggest motivating factor as um, you know, for their team specifically doing well. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering how you think this is going to, uh, you know, affect the athletic departments themselves, the teams, even the, the athletes. Um, any, any sort of trickle down effects you can anticipate here? I mean, I think the quality of the sport is just going to continue to improve. And hopefully the quality of, you know, life for the athletes is going to continue to improve. Um, the one thing, you know, the one caveat I want to make is there have been some people who've pointed out that, you know, both the men's and the women's unit systems, um, you know, they give money for how well the players play to the schools. Uh, the players don't see that money. I mean, obviously, you know, the, there's a pending settlement where there could be revenue sharing for the top programs where men's and women's basketball players could get some of that money, but it's not like they're getting part of these units. The units go to the schools. And that's been a, a major criticism um, of the whole system, like in general. So I think that's important to keep in mind, but it definitely isn't going to decrease the quality of play or of life for any of these athletes. Let's put it that way. And any next steps that you're you're looking for, you know, as as this all unfolds? Well, I think the implementation, um, the formula, it's it's going to be interesting to see, you know, based on the formula, how much each unit is worth. I'm sure folks are already trying to do those calculations, but they're honestly like kind of above my pay grade from a math perspective. Maybe we can get someone else at FOS on that, but. <laughs> Um, you know, and then the next question is like in 2032, yes, it's renegotiating the media deal, but also look out for um, who owns the rights to these championship sponsorships, because right now CBS and Warner Brothers Discovery own those rights. And that's, you know, I, that's a whole separate podcast episode about the how that system is very unequal and inequitable. So that's like the next thing really that needs to change. Very interesting. Amanda Krisovich, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Warner Bros. Discovery was already walking a tightrope as it tries to cling to NBA media rights and launch a legally contested streaming service with Fox and Disney. Now it's been thrown a bowling ball amid that balancing act with its latest earnings report, including a $9.1 billion write-down of the company's value. Our newsletter writer, David Rumsey, has the nuances, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer, David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. 
Great to have you on. Um, it has not been a great week for Warner Brothers Discovery. Uh, they had a really rough earnings report. Their stock has tumbled quite a lot. What's gone wrong for this company? Basically, they are not worth as much as they thought they were, or they were projected to be, or they were expecting to be. There's a number floating out there, about $9.1 billion in impairment charge they took. Basically, they're worth nine billion dollars less than they were supposed to be because of their tv business and their cable business and it's just not exactly what it was supposed to be and obviously they have been in the headlines this week and this uh, month and this summer for losing the rights to the nba which will start after next season of course they're going to be suing the nba after they weren't able to match amazon's offer but that's the the turmoil right now obviously they're bigger than just a sports company but sports is a big part of why they're not succeeding on Wall Street right now. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at the numbers and like, it, they look really rough. I mean, yeah, you've mentioned the $9.1 billion write down. Right now, after their stock drops, something like 15% over the last week, roughly, um, their market cap is just over $17 billion. Um, they have a ton of debt. Um, so, you know, $41.4 billion in, in gross debt. So not looking great. How is David Zasloff talking about this, spinning this in terms of the company's future? Right. So that's the CEO of Warner Bros. Discovery. And obviously, he's going to paint a rosier picture than a lot of headlines are going to be out there, right? So on um, Wednesday afternoon on the WBD earnings call, he was, you know, projecting forward a lot and, you know, admitting some mistakes, but trying to paint a nice picture of what might be ahead. And when he was getting grilled on sports questions around the NBA, he was really deflecting and saying, you know, can't say too much, you know, we're in litigation where, you know, there's a lawsuit going on trying to figure out those matching rights with the NBA. So he wouldn't really discuss, you know, what he expects for the NBA. But one thing that Zaslav was trying to tout was, hey, there's more sports at TNT Sports than just uh, the NBA, right? There's a NHL where they... Uh, broadcast the Stanley Cup final every other year. They just signed a new deal for the French Open that's going to begin next year. They're going to be simulcasting some college football playoff games. Obviously, there's March Madness that we know of. That runs through 2032 with uh, CBS. So that, that's just a sample of what they have beyond the NBA. And obviously, that was the kind of the core, right, of TNT uh, was the NBA. So it's, it's not that simple, but that's kind of how he's trying to frame it, especially when it comes to sports. Do you feel like... Yes, there's enough there for this company to, you know, be considered a still a, a sports destination, even without the NBA. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And obviously, uh, earlier this year, you know, Warner Bros. Discovery was in talks with maybe some sort of merger or takeover with Paramount, which that's fizzled out and Paramount's looking elsewhere for, for that um, uh, acquisition. But yeah, I don't know. I think they have a lot of really good sports assets and then you look at uh, they're trying to put live sports on max you have hbo which is you know building up even more hard knock series with the nfl right so there's a lot there but are they going to survive on their own uh, i don't know is another company going to come in and take them over or possibly merge and uh, you know take over that tnt sports brand that that seems like a logical outcome but that that's for uh, the people with all the deep pockets to figure out yeah, and of course, there's also Venue Sports, which is, you know, their, you know, try-owned thing mm -hmm. with Fox and Disney. And that's, you know, right now, the there could be some legal stuff with that. But, I mean, I, I feel like they're, they're going to need to team up, um, you know, I, obviously, if they have to be legally allowed to do so. But uh, it it's, feels like it's going to be hard for them to survive in the media world of the future and also with just with all the the debt they have on hand um right it, it's going to be hard to you know like build out and be productive and proactive um you know with with all that um yeah because they're gonna have to to cut down assets it seems yeah like. and and you bring up a good point it's like you look at why they were valued at such a lower number than what they're supposed to be it's because they're so heavily involved in uh, TV and, and cable and their streaming isn't as robust as a lot of these other companies, right? And that's kind of why they lost the NBA rights because the NBA wants to be able to go to an Amazon and get it on, st on streaming, right? So it's for, for um, the NBA, they have uh, you know ESPN, they have NBC, big you know, sports network, over the air network, and then they have 
Amazon now, which is, you know, everybody has Prime Video, right? And Max, a WBD streaming service, just doesn't have as many subscribers, obviously, as a Prime Video, uh, and they can't offer that same audience. So they're kind of stuck in the middle. What, you know, as far as like the media world, are we sticking to cable? Are we trying to get uh, get in on streaming? Uh, but, you know, they do have, like you mentioned, Venue Sports. They also have a, a bundle alliance with Disney Plus and, and Max. That's not really sports related, but, you know, it's all it's all kind of tied together there. So, yeah, I think they're trying to figure it out. But the answer is NBA opted for NBC and Amazon. It seems like, I mean, one, I don't know if they had the money to match NBC, um, you know, because again, they're, they're having some, right. some balance sheet issues. Um, but then, you know, they, they've got this, like this legacy NBA show and inside the NBA that is much loved and is like kind of the, you know, the example of, you know, a great, you know, pregame, postgame, just like shoulder programming mm -hmm. show. Um, and the NBA still said, yeah, that that's thanks, nice, but, no but you know, we, yeah, we, no thanks. Right. We, we want, you know, the, the broadcaster of the future who's already in, you know, it's on everyone's computer, which is, which WBD is not. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you speak to a good point. There is that, that branding there, and they're going to be on March Madness for the rest of this decade into early next decade. We'll see if that continues. Who knows what the media landscape will look like then. But yeah, the TNT brand is strong, but it's been so heavily associated with the NBA. Is it going to be as strong when it's a mixture of some college football playoff games and then some French Open and then some Big East basketball and some NASCAR eventually? Maybe so. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe that sports uh, tie-in is enough for people to sign up for Max along with want to watch the movies and the programming that you get from HBO and, you know, the other um, WB movies. But, you know, I don't know. It's it, it doesn't seem like there's enough sports to make it a must-have service. Like, uh, that's the goal, right? Whether you're ESPN Plus or Peacock or whatever, you want to be a must-have service. And a lot of those services are using sports to make them can't miss. I, I don't know if Max is at that point right now. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of inherently skeptical of like a little bit of this, a little bit of that kind of strategy. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes going forward. David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. These Olympic Games have featured some impressive youth athletes, and the United States has one more debuting later today. The U.S. will feature its youngest ever male track and field Olympian this afternoon, with 16-year-old Quincy Wilson set to run in the 4x400 men's relay event. Wilson was added to the team in July after not qualifying for the individual 400 meters in Olympic trials. He holds the world record for the under 18 400 meters at just 44.2 seconds. It is unclear whether Wilson would participate in the gold medal event on Saturday if the U.S. qualifies, as teams are permitted to adjust their teams between events. Nonetheless, Wilson can feel proud to be part of a U.S. track and field collective that has helped deliver 21 medals in this event, including gold in both of the past two Olympics. Jalen Brown has been engaged in a rather public quarrel with Team USA Basketball over the past few weeks, but it seems like the grudge is one-sided. On Wednesday, Team USA President Grant Hill went on the All the Smoke podcast and said that he expected to sit down with the reigning finals MVP and, quote, get to some level of understanding and he'll be a candidate, if he wants, in 28. Prior to this, Hill had called Brown's comments a conspiracy theory, which the Celtic star did not take kindly to. Seems as though Hill is doing what he can to right the ship, especially as Team USA coach Steve Kerr's rotations have come under scrutiny during these Olympic Games. That's the problem with bringing in the best of the best. There's only 12 spots and one ball. HBCU Go was founded 12 years ago to put historically black colleges and universities on the sports media map, but the company has leveled up in the last three years with its purchase by media mogul Byron Allen. HBCU Go co-founder and president Curtis Simons joins the show to discuss the origins of the company. Now it's growing in a convoluted media landscape. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Curtis Simons, president and co-founder of HBCU Go. Welcome, Curtis. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, so so great to have you on. So um, HBCU Go is a sports and entertainment company focused on historically black colleges and universities. You founded in 2012. What was the vision for the company when you launched it 12 years ago? Good question. I, I graduated out of an HBCU uh, school in Ohio by the name of Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. 
Uh, and I actually grew up on a campus. I actually was moved to Ohio from Bermuda when I was two years old. My mother taught there for 40 years. My father worked, father worked in the maintenance department for 50 years. And I graduated from Central State in, 20, in 78. And when I left Central State, I was fortunate to get into the media business and had a great 40-plus uh, years in the media business from some runs in, running cable system with the old Continental Cable Vision, going to ESPN for, for quite a few years, and then finishing up at uh, BET for 14 years, executive vice president of marketing. But one of the things that I always felt was that historical black colleges and universities did not get the exposure of the big colleges out there and what could be done to try to move them in that right direction. And when I looked at the history of historical black colleges, one of the selling points that I always did when I was on the street early on trying to really sell this channel to, to someone was that just in, just in fact, if you went to the NFL Hall of Fame right now, the group that leads the Hall of Fame players are members of the HBCU circle. And, you know, when I kind of did my homework on it, it really made sense that now more than ever is the time to try to give these schools more exposure. Because when you look at the transition of sports, you know, you look at the early 60s and 70s, those players who were in the Hall of Fame couldn't get in the Maryland's, the, the you know, uh, Ohio State's, you know, the USC's, the UCLA's of the world. But then, you know, coaches got smart and said, you know, to get the best athletes, I've got to go get some African-American kids who could play. And that changed the landscape for HBCUs because no longer were they getting the great players that are coming in. That got spread out and the, and, the, and, the, and the talent line got thinned out because of it. And so if you don't get the exposure out there, it's hard to get kids to attend HBCUs. And if you're a top uh, today, if you're a top talent, you know, the first words out of most kids' mouths is, hey, coach, how many times are I going to be on television? And when you can't answer that, you know, and you're looking at another school like Michigan, Ohio State, or others who say, hey, we're on every Saturday. Well, right, that's, that's a game changer. So my goal was to create a channel and create a streaming channel that could begin to start helping students, really more African-American and many multicultural students, and even white students, attend HBCUs so they can look at the opportunity to get into the major leagues like the NFL. NBA, you know, soccer, you know, and others. And so the concept was, was to try to give, you know, these schools exposure, but at the same time, also, Quinn, try to educate people on the history, the value, the legacy of historical black college universities. And so one of the things that I've been also driving is the lifestyle of HBCUs, the education of HBCUs, because if you went around, there's 107 African, HBCUs out there. If you went into each one of them, you would be surprised how they all feature something different. That from, you know, nursing schools to North Carolina A&T being the most strong in technology to all, every single one of them having a expertise that a lot of people don't even know of. So if I'm able to open that door and begin to start providing that awareness I think that's a big, a big thing. And we were fortunate that, you know, one of the things that once Byron bought my, my network that he came up, which I think was a, was a brilliant business plan, like, let's go after the sports side of the business. You know, let's lock down the conferences. So we have a 10-year deal with the SWAC now. We have a 10-year deal with CIAA. We have a 10-year deal with SIC, and we're working on the MEAC. We lock all four. We got three out of the four. We get the fourth with MEAC. We're really controlling, you know, black college sports. You know, and so... That's kind of our mission right now, but also looking at how we can spread our wings out because we, all, we don't want to be just known for football and basketball. We also want to be known for the other sports that are out there because there's a lot of great athletes. If you looked at the Olympics, just, uh, just, it just took place. You had 10, you know, HBCUs that participated from different countries, you know, and that shows you, you know, that there's some growth out there, but people got to know. So that's really was the vision going into it. Yeah, you mentioned uh, how HBCU Go was purchased by Allen Media Group, you know, run by Byron Allen and uh, three yes. years ago. Uh, you, you already were starting to get into that, but how, how did that transform the business? It transformed it dr dramatically, dramatically. I mean, I was a guy out there for 12 years trying to get a channel up and going on the streaming side. And that, you know, it, 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 was, it was an education in the business world that, I have many people say, hey, Curtis, I like your concept, 
And then I would say, well, if you like my concept, why don't you invest? Well, I, I like to see it. You know, I like to see what's, how it runs. How, how, how are you going to make things happen? And all I can say is that, you know, Byron Allen bought into my dream and was able to help me live my lifelong dream of making historical black colleges, putting them on the map. And I think that is, is, is the challenge that we have out there. We're beginning to slowly but surely roll that out, you know, and, 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 and to have someone who believes in you, as I worked for Bob Johnson for many years, who believed in me, and we, that's how we grew BT, you know, that's a gym. And, and, that, and that's a game changer, you know, because he has always said, Byron has always been strong about black-owned media. I think he's always been a, a major proponent of trying to position you know, us in, in the right way in the community. I think he's made a great stance to say that he has to do something in the HBCU circle and coming up with HBCU Go makes a lot of sense. And he's backed it, you know. And so we are beginning to really grow and really position ourselves as to be, you know, a predominant channel out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like that speaks to sort of this chicken egg problem that a lot of, of newer media properties have where, to grow, they need investment, but yep. often the people who'd be making that investment want to say, well, you know, let, let's see you succeed, yep. you know, without that investment first. Yep. You know, that's, that's a big issue in women's sports and, as and, well. And, and that's tough. And, that's, and, I, and I think one of the things that, you know, uh, Alan Media Group brought to the table for HBCU Go is, is one of the big animals is distribution. You know, in our, in our football games, in our basketball games right now, some other sports, you know, we have a syndicated uh, box that Andy Temple runs and his team, and they've done a great job of this year, for example, really growing it. We're almost at 80% television households, about 95% African-American households. Then you have the Griot channel, which is a linear channel, which carries uh, some of our other games on their channel on weekends. And then we have HC Go. You know, when you have that kind of distribution, that, that's, a, that's a major player out there because now we're giving these universities like a SWAC who's more of a Southeast Conference type being seen in L.A., Wyoming, San Diego. They wouldn't be seen that much in there. And now what's even better is you have a lot of parents who couldn't see HBCU games, have an opportunity to see HBCU games and see their son and daughters play. You know, and, that, and that's really what it's all about. And that goes back to my earlier words about exposure. You know, now it's getting to be where more and more people can see the product. And now, you know, two years ago, three years ago back, on it was like, you know, people would say to me, what is HBC Go? Now I walk in the room, it, it's a different message. Hey, I, I'm watching your channel. It's, it's good stuff. You know, I like what I'm seeing. And yeah, how are you growing that audience, you know, getting people both aware of it and, and also tuning in, you know, in a sports landscape where, I mean, sports media is more valuable than it's ever been. At the same time, there's, yeah. there's so many things you could watch at any moment. Uh, you can be a fan of like snooker and like that's you, you can watch all the snooker you want. So like, exactly. how do you get people to like, you know, seek well, out we, HBCU go? We, we had a, we, we, we're working on a pretty good plan right now. The first year was we're going into year three. The first year plan was to work on putting out a good product because in the African-American community on it, if you don't do it, if you don't do it right out the gates, they're not coming back. So our goal was to put a good product out there, which we were able to do. Second year, we wanted to upgrade the product so that we could be compared to some of the big dogs out there, you know. And then this year, we're working very hard through our marketing and social media side, cross-promotional side of driving the brand, driving HBCU Go and HBCU Go Sports and driving the brand. So we're doing a lot of work in the social media uh, angle. We're, we're really banging a lot on that. We're doing uh, now that from the syndication side, we've got a lot of affiliates out there who are wanting to run our cross promotional spots. We've got our talent going into these cities and doing, you know, drops for these for these stations. And then we're doing the same thing across the board of our own channels. You know, we're promoting it on the grill. We're promoting it on our local now. We're promoting it on the weather channel, you know, where there's more distribution out there and more eyeballs. And so the more and more that we can get, the brand and people start feeling the brand and more and more we're getting sensitivity to say, I hear you. I mean, I get comments now on where people say, Hey, I, I see you guys everywhere now. I, I didn't see that years ago. So it, it's a slow crawl on, but we are beginning to really start, you know, turning the corner and just even interview with you guys. I've been, I've been actually getting to get this interview for years, 
you know, and to have you guys step in and say, because I follow you guys distinctly every day, you know, and to have you guys step up and say, let me talk to this guy and find out who are they? Who is HBCU Go? Uh, it's big, you know, because you are in the line of where people are reading and seeing your stuff every day. And to have us associated with your brand, you know, that's big. Because one of the things that I'm trying to drive more of is that what I did in my old BT life um, was that it was, I wanted to make sure and tie ourselves into some of the bigger brands, the NFL, NBA, Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball. Because if we can find some partnership ways with those brands, that also brings in some more levativity out there on the game. And that's what we're trying to really continue to build on. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, you mentioned BET. Of course, you worked at ESPN as well. You know, those are businesses that, that built themselves on cable. Um, sure. That's that's where the money was in you know, sure. the 90s, early 2000s. Um, where do you focus your energy today in terms of building that audience? Because, you know, you got to meet people where they are, but people are kind of all over the place right now. Well, number one is that if you look at the African-American audience, the alumni base of HBCU is over 7 million. You know, so we're really targeting a lot of messaging to that alumni because the alumni base is really, you know, the rock and roll of, of historical black colleges. The job that we've got to improve on is hitting that Gen Zen, you know, area because they don't watch our TV. They're, they're computers. They're on the iPads. They're on the phones. So that's where the social media is really where we've got to spend some big time pushing that angle. And one of the things that we're uh, trying our social media group has done a good job is we've had attended all the media days for uh, all the the uh, the conferences over the last last month or so. And we've really partnered ourselves up with a lot of the players who are supposed to be some of the top players you know, within each conference, and they're working, helping us out, and sending messaging out to that Gen Z world to help say, hey, watch me on HBCU go on such such date, you know, and then I think the other thing that we're also doing, we're getting smarter, slowly but surely smarter on, on how we're looking at talking to this audience. Number one, you know, the thing for me is that I, I challenged my team this year to help work on our football schedule and create more rivalry type games. Games where we know it's going to drive people because it's more rivalry driven. Secondly, one of the big things in the African American HBC community is homecomings. We're doing six homecomings this year, and uh, and, and and some good in good markets where I think we're going to really be able to drive the, the marketplace to people. Are going to drive the awareness of what we're doing. And one of the things that we're also touching on too on is we're driving culture. Making people understand the culture of HBCUs, which a lot of people don't understand. They look at it and just like, oh, okay, well, that's the African American school. That's it. No. There's a culture out there you need to understand better. So we're going to weave that into your mentality to make you understand that, hey, is it just the same thing I used to say when I was at BT? It's not black entertainment television, it's programming. And when you understand it's good programming, you're going to watch it. And that's why you have major crossover in African American product because people want to watch good programming. And we believe that if we can create that destination to drive good programming, we will get people crossing over, not just the African American market, across the board to watch HBCU sports. Very interesting stuff. Curtis Simons, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, for, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Oh, and thank you very much for having me, man. It's a pleasure, and I hope you bring me back. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend and throw us a like and subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We will see you on Monday.